Good evening, folks. Welcome to week five, the our edition of the That's a Terrible Tongue Tie Reese. Way to go. Anyway, it's the Friday flash forward on a Thursday for the in between the two super weeks. And I've I'm Reese Loltice, and I've got with me Callum. How are you going, Callum? Yeah, I'm not doing too bad. Just coming off a nice, exciting week of the OPL. What about you, Reese? Doing doing well. Uh, I was also quite intrigued by the the super week we just had, and very much looking forward to the next super week we've got, the last of the two, and of course it is going to be headspace round, which is a very very good thing, very important message for 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 all, not just not just the the, the youth based focus that headspace is, but mental health is very very important. So that's a gr- great initiative that the OPL is doing. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's definitely a great initiative, and I think particularly in esports where not necessarily recognized as much as what it should be especially when we've got a lot of young kids who are inexperienced and especially with the gaming houses moving out of home at a young age and experience is really really important yeah couldn't agree more we're going to get a little bit more into the into a bit of the headspace sort of stuff uh, later on in the episode but for now what we thought we'd do for you is we'd just quickly um you know, and super quickly go over week five's results pretty much as expected would you say i think you know, there's only really one result that um, you could have seen going either way for my money, which was the first one, and that was the uh, the only two one of the week with Legacy falling to Avant two one. Any thoughts there, real quick? I got one word for you, Reese. What what's that hit me with it? Legatos. Legatos indeed. That's uh, becoming a bit of a thing lately. Um, with the the oh, I don't really know the word I want to use. It's some some at times baffling yeah tosses throws that they're making um some i mean and the, the spectacular one was that legacy did was in was at the end of the week against tectonic where they waited at baron for seemingly an eternity before they eventually getting stood up and throwing at baron anyway <laughs> um but yeah as we said a victory for avant and now they're, now they're four and one up on uh on, on Legacy over the split, which is eerily reminiscent of how they looked against Sin in l- this time last year. So let's hope for their sake they don't complete that trend and lose to Sin in the Gauntlet. Uh, uh, sorry, lose the Legacy in the Gauntlet. Jeez, um, good luck. Uh, Sin, uh, Sin in the Gauntlets are not looking likely, but that'll be a sight to see. Um, moving on, though, to this this upcoming week. We've got six matches, and really we're starting to get to the whole meat and potatoes of the season. This. Some real spicy matchups in the last half of the season, and they st- arguably it's real, really get starts cracking this week. So let's get straight into it. First, first cab off the ranks is Tectonic against Chiefs, a rematch from week three, if I'm not mistaken. Yet week three, where the Chiefs took down Tectonic 2-0. How are you seeing the uh, the Chiefs taking on Tectonic this time around? Well, for starters, it's probably definitely going to be 2-0. Tectonic yeah. are not picking out a victory. They may have picked up a victory against AV a couple of weeks ago, but they're definitely not dropping a game to Chiefs. Uh, Chiefs have come off a dominant week. Um, also to note is that Chiefs are starting to gel a lot more. They are starting to play cleaner League of Legends, as they showed against the Bant last week. Tectonic is still finding their footing. Their early games are starting to be a little bit cleaner. They're more consistent. When I, but when I say consistent doesn't necessarily mean all good things obviously low and tilting in the bot lane are mediocre at best they're picking yeah, lanes true. that even should be winning and they're not pushing their pushing the lane at all so and if that's happening then raisin destiny is just going to roll over the bot lane and it's going to snowball to the rest of the map yeah it feels a bit rough for um for tectonic just from a matchup perspective like this the the thing i wanted to talk about with this matchup is the 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 other at the other end of the map and the first first time around we saw Paprise up against Big Swifts. Um and Paprise seemed to do quite well for himself in, in the top lane, at least during laning phase, but wasn't really able to make use of that uh, throughout the game and came out of the match with two pretty brutal looking score lines, which for me and I think I've mentioned this somewhere at least if not in the podcast somewhere in writing at least, that it's very reminiscent of how Praetith looked uh for previously TM gaming. Um, against Swiper last year, in which he was a Praetith. Yeah, Praetith on Team. I'm not going crazy, am I? Oh, uh, it was Praetith on Team yeah, 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 Gaming. 
um, Praetor sort of smacked around Swiper a bit in laning phase. I think it was Fiora into Nah, I want to say that matchup was that I'm thinking about. Um, Solo killed him at least once, definitely killed him twice in lane. And then uh, Chiefs equally smacked around the rest of the map, and then Fiora was forced into to defending defending the five, because um, Nah couldn't split, handle the Fiora split, so he just grouped. Fiora came in as a as a two zero, you know, very far ahead Fiora into a team fight, going, "Hi, I'm Fiora and I'm fed. Please don't play around my repost and kill me. Oh no, you played around repost and killed me." And then he also ended up uh, uh, after a very strong laning phase with pretty hideous looking score lines. And we know that KD8 is and everything, but that's the thing that worries me about this this matchup is that I think that the bot lane is a huge advantage for the Chiefs. Mid lane, you'd say on paper is Ryoma favoured, but Shock has been very, very impressive this split. So that leaves the power point in the on the map as as the top top lane if they're going to find it anywhere. Um, possibly Swaith might be able to do something against Babbitt in the jungle, but as far as lanes are concerned, you're looking at Paparize. And not only has he shown this, but over time this this team um, has shown that they can't do anything with a decently ahead top laner. So after that long-winded rant on top lane, um, is there anything that that um, that that maybe Tectonic can look to do to sort of babysit a bit or look to better translate the, their top lane advantage if they if they're lucky enough to get one or good enough to get one, I should say. Uh, so personally, I think a big issue for Tectonic is especially in regards to team fighting and engaging is they're very reactive. So what that means is if they have, say, a top lane tank, Orn is a little bit of a bad example due to the dynamic that he has being able to be bonk middle engage. But what basically happens is on the tanks, it's okay, we have a lead, we kind of need to engage. They're not going to engage, they're looking at stalling out games. And then conversely, you look at, say, a split push and you get to the dynamic where it's, okay, we want to stall the game and you got no pressure to, to um, create for your top laner in the split push, so it's going to be, they're going to push the wave, say, halfway. What's going to happen is they have to back off, they don't have the support around the map, you can't trade size effectively, so the other top laner catches the wave, the other top laner might even start to create um, a pushing advantage. So basically for Tectonic, uh, I'm looking at trying to be more proactive in the earlier phases of the game, because honestly, You'll get away, I've said this many times, many times, you'll get away with it against Legacy, you won't get away with it against the other teams in the, other, in the OPL, and Chiefs is definitely one of those teams. Right, so are we looking for um, the team to come to Paparize, or, the, or Paparize to come to the team? Like, you're talking about these pushing waves, that sounds like you want, you actually kind of want neither, you want him to stay there and perhaps to play better around that pressure that he's trying to create? Um... So it works two ways, and it depends on entirely on what they choose to do. I think that Paparize has looked good on Orn, not necessarily in the team fights, but he has looked good enough on Orn in the laning phase to say, okay, we can still play Orn. But I think your biggest advantage is going to, probably going to be putting Paparize in a bad and an advantageous top lane matchup and trying to be able to bully around Swiper a little bit with some creative pathing from Swaith, which he has shown in the OPL so far, although I can't necessarily say I agree with all of his early game decisions in the jungle, but he has shown enough creative pathing to say that if he does do some oddball path, then he should be able to translate the lead into top lane, and Paparize will at least be able to push it a little bit. It's on the team to be able to create a dynamic that allows him to push it, though. For sure. Um, that's the one... I, I pretty much agree with your, your take on Sway there, too. I think the, the phrase that I've been using for him is calm and competent without being spectacular and that might sound like damning him with faint praise i guess to an extent but i think that's a really good trait for a jungler to have is that you know you've, you've seen some of the occasional rookie jungler come in and be flashy and dynamic and then fall fall a bit flat um also on some less less than stellar teams probably guts is the primary example of someone i'm thinking about there so someone who can play some calm and controlled league is definitely um a good sign for a rookie jungler and while, while, as you say, Sway hasn't covered himself 100% in glory, it's been a an encouraging start for, from from the young jungler. But ultimately, it's we're, we're thinking it's going to be all for naught, and we're ex you're expecting a pretty convincing Chiefs victory there. Very convincing. 
Mm. And might go slightly over the hour, but I'm doubting it. Yeah, <laughs> an hour total, of course. Um, although having said that, it just I just remembered that um, Tectonic had a pretty strong early game in week three against the Chiefs, if I if I remember correctly. Um, although it's arguable uh, whether or not that was how much of that was Tectonic being good and how much of that was. And there's certainly a couple of instances of it that uh, Chiefs might have been something you could politely call hard trolling. Um, I, I think definitely that... recall some interesting Nunu play. <laughs> and uh, From uh, Carbon's understudy. Who would have thought? From Baby Carbon himself. No, let's, 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 not, uh, let's not be mean to Timmy like that. Um, the one thing I wanted to... The reason I brought up that, that early game in, is that um, the one thing that uh, Tectonic's got to be able to do is control destiny, I think, in this matchup. Um, as I said, the Chiefs were not having a fun time of things early, and his, I believe he played Rakan and Alistar in those two games and really monstered those two games. Anyone who says support can't carry, watch Destiny in the previous Tectonic Chiefs matchup because he was absolutely immense. And I would tip him to... If they can't control him, he will, could very easily take over this set as well. Definitely agree there. Especially with the bot lane, they're just a little bit too passive and unlocking Destiny, especially on picks like Rakan and Alistar. <sighs> what a sight to see. So, moving into the next set, um, we've got another upper table versus bottom, t uh, bottom three matchup in Sin taking on order. First meeting, if I'm not mistaken, of Jews and his former bot lane, Rogan FBI. A very that's an interesting dynamic or what are, what are you making of this match what are the early signs looking for for this so for sin gaming they have shown oh no i'm wrong song. they have already played i just completely flubbed that one it's the second meeting i have uh, <laughs> whoops <laughs> yeah definitely it is because it yeah, it's, it's actually four... it's, uh, no it's week three again it was three. actually it's the, yeah. these are the same two matches from saturday on that we're having on friday i completely forgot about that whoopsies <laughs> So... We can edit this out, can't we? <laughs> oh no, we're live! No! Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. That was a flub. So, for Sin Gaming. Um, so, for Sin, I'm looking at, particularly in this series, I'm looking at Praetith to have to get something done. So, Praetith and Jupes mainly. They need to somehow be able to get, once again... Side lane split push. Praetith is known for that style. Juice has been known to be able to get split pushing top laner ahead. We've seen it with Dockler Flares. So, Sin are going to have to play around that dynamic. Dream and Kuden showing good signs, particularly Dream. Dream has been very stable. Probably the best overall player on Sin. While not showing anything truly special, he's tr uh, shown to be very stable. You know what he's, you're going to get from him. And from a rookie, that's a really important quality. And he's only just going to step it up. He's 17. He's young. And But from when I look at... City on Earth. From Gareth. what? Greatest City, city, on, greatest Earth. city on Earth. What's that? He's a Perth boy. Oh. I almost thought you were going to say Melbourne. Are you kidding? There's bloody snakes As everyone in does. Ac actual snakes in Melbourne. <laughs> Yes, but Order, I think, as long as they play stable, clean League of Legends, they don't try to push too hard, they don't try to get greedy, they should be able to take it cleanly. Um, expect to see GP banned, Tally's probably getting nowhere near that GP. Sure, Praetith might pull something out against it, but just leave GP out of his hands, please should not happen if i'm reading that reading this correctly um sin have blue side do you think they'll try and pick it up the gp that is potentially but i think if sin are picking gp they are leaving the game but letting the game go too long which will be to order's advantage good point the other thing i'm just quickly checking here and is Sin have... Oh, hang on a minute. I'm just looking up a, the, the, a tool we have to check these sorts of things. Uh, they are... Good if I could read my own tool. They've only banned it twice. 
Sin? Yeah. Which means... And they banned it once on blue side, once on red side, so that means that they're letting it through. Conversely, for Sin, you could say that they are wanting to play, God forbid, Sin Fighto style. So oh, they are I'm looking to that. abuse opponents through early game team fighting. Okay, this is interesting. And I GP is an online bind then. That's a good point. They've actually faced, they've picked Gangplank no times, played against it five, and it's banned it, banned it twice. So that means that this was as of week four, which they'd played, they'd lost every game except for, and that this was the week they beat Bombers, which was, so this is nine games they played it, and they've, it's gotten through pick banned twice. Basically, I think what that says to me, just without actually going and looking at VODs specifically on this, is that their their plan might very well be to give Gangplank to the opposition to try and counter it with a strong early lane and split push champion, something like a Camille, which if memory says they've played at least a couple of times. Um, and that could be how they're trying to keep down... They're, they're trying to put people onto Camille so that they can then... Sorry, onto, onto Gangplank so that they can then bully in lane. But I don't know if I like that plan against Tally's gameplay in particular, which is very strong. Yeah, and as I said, Simfardo, so potentially they can look to get the Gangplank over and try to push an early game teamfight advantage, because obviously Gangplank takes his time to scale, one item's not great, two item, of course he hits these items quickly, but he really does need those items before he can actually teamfight, he, and also the levels, levels are really important on Gangplank at Beyond to get those barrels out. But yeah, for me, ought to take it really cleanly as long as they... At least try to play some remotely clean League of Legends. Obviously against Sin, not going to be 100% clean. But as clean as they can, they should really just be able to take it. For sure. The one thing, that you, you've talked about Praetith as, a, as an important point for Sin. The one thing I think that's important for them in, in, in having any avenue to victory is going to be Bedoink in the mid lane. He's had a couple of couple of fantastic efforts on obviously Cassiopeia which has been the wins that they've picked up and a couple of decent showings in some of his losses but the, if, if, there's, if there's any point that you could look at it for order and say that um, he's not living up to what is to be fair really high expectations for what's a new team it's for my money it's Swiffer he's lost he's lost some matchups that I didn't expect him to and he's lost some matchups harder than what you would expect for his for his pedigree as a as a premier oceanic mid laner for his whole career, so it, it might have to be the Bedoink show. Is if they can't keep the tally down, I would look towards Bedoink as Bedoink v Swiffer as one as another really important matchup for that for for these two teams. Yeah, potentially, and as you said, Swiffer's had a little bit of a rough season. He's honestly probably been on the decline since Split Two last year, even. Um, but as you said, okay, so with Bedoink, I think he's very good on a niche couple of champions. Cassiopeia is one of them. He was really good on that in the OCS. Another one which is starting to crop up a little bit, I believe it was Victor. I will say, uh, I remember him having, I feel like I remember having a real monster of a game on Victor for Athletico, but I don't know if I just made that memory up. I believe I the other one OCS. from memory is Victor. Obviously, we're going to just completely disregard Yeswo because we are not seeing that ever again. We can only pray. But if Victor comes out, potentially it will allow um, Sin to stabilize the mid lane even more. And if Swiffer does have another rough week, then potentially Bedoink is able to run over and potentially start snowballing Sin gaming. That's what it looks like they'll be going for but like to just echo you I um as much as I would love to see Sin pick up some more points and put some pressure on some teams that are frankly rapidly getting away from them in, in the gauntlet standings I do agree that this is probably going to be a, um, all three points going over to the order boys from Melbourne moving on now to Saturday and oh Saturday Whew, this is exciting um these are probably the among the two most exciting matches that we've had so far the split, although a lot of that is maybe influenced by where these teams are on the ladder. Excuse me one moment. 
Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, we've got Avant going up against Order in the first match of Saturday, which is pretty hype and might be um on paper you'd expect Order to handle this pretty comfortably, but I think there's a cup there's a genuine chance here for Avant to take the set. What do you think? I think this is an interesting matchup because Order haven't really faced too many tough opponents. Obviously, they're versus Direwolves. But besides that, they haven't really had their tough matches yet. And so what that means is Order is, for the most part, untested against the rest of the upper, quad uh, upper quadrant of the OPL. So... For me, Order should be able to take it comfortably. I think they overall have stronger players. They match up better. Um, but for me, I think for AV, their early game has been very, very lackluster, especially last week. And if we saw throughout the early weeks, we saw AV basically executing a really planned out strategy where it was, okay, Frey, you're on CC mid laner. You're going top lane. You're hopping Pabu out. He's going to be on Nah. You're going to try a snowball Pabu. And then we're going to play through that. But in recent weeks, they kind of... Like last week, they kind of abandoned it. But I think the biggest problem for AB at the moment is their bottom lane. Teams are exploiting their bottom lane as heavily as possible. And as we saw last week... um. I'm trying to think of a game in particular. I think game two against Legacy in particular was just, okay, uh, Claire, you got priority, you're running bot. AV's bot lane collapsed. Under the pressure. Which was the, which was the game that Legacy's bot lane collapsed? Was that the same one or was that game three? That might have been game three. I'm just trying to think that was the game that... um. The game that Raid hung a lot of deaths on the board. Might have been game three. Obviously, there were a lot of games last week. I can't remember them all off the top Actually, of my head. Actually, I think it was game three because it was the game I didn't watch. Because um, anyway, we'll we'll get to we'll get to why I didn't watch that when we get to Legacy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you sorry you were saying so the the um people are exploiting Advanced bot lane. My apologies. Continue. Yeah, and. Another thing we've seen from Vance bot lane is they aren't necessarily inclined to respect. Um, maybe respect isn't the correct word, but they're not willing to back off the turret as early as what they should. So they're giving up some death, extra deaths there. Obviously, you get Blinky behind. Bensel hit the nail on the head last week, where he's like, Blinky is a player, if he has a good laning phase, he will look good for the rest of the game, but if he has a bad laning phase, then he'll look then he'll look to be in his shell and he's not looking like the player that we all know he can be. So teams are looking to try uh exploit the A V bot lane and it will be interesting to see how A V react against Order, who obviously have arguably the strongest bot lane in the OPL and FBI and Rogue. So the one thing I sort of want to um and I guess a little bit come to the defense of the Avant bot lane is that the, um, I think that they actually, this is not the, I don't think this is, for one, I don't think this is the right meta for them. And, and the reason why is that of the one thing Avant did really, really well last year is that for my money, they were the best team in the league at going backwards. And that sounds weird. Why would you want to go backwards? But, um, one of the most important, because Oceania is a region that loves to fight so much. Um, the, one of the most important skills is knowing when not to fight or one, or being able to fight on your terms. And Avant were really good at controlling the pace and pace of the play and distance when they were going backwards towards their base and bringing the opponents into them, drawing them a little bit over, more ex overextended than perhaps they would have liked, and then capitalizing on that. And that's not just a comment on Jake's champion pool being the meme that he's a Nami player, um, although Nami is a, is a champion that really does facilitate that. Um, they really like to go backwards and, like I said, and control the, the pace of, the, of not just their lane but overall game really well. And... FBI and Rogue, Rogue in particular, is a is a bot lane that really likes to go forwards, and they're at the most comfortable when they're really ramming advantages down the throat of the opponent. And this is not the meta where going backwards is very good and going forwards is super good, particularly with Stopwatch allowing so many turret dies. So the one thing that um I think if that Avant can do with their bot lane is that if they can get in a situation where they can go backwards with control, if they can like maintain a neutral lane and then 
encourage over over commitment um, from from the order bot lane. Particularly, um, so from time to time, Rogue does seem to get a little frustrated when he, when nothing's happening in a lane. Um, they are getting better at that and just farming lanes out that need to be farmed out. But from time to time, particularly when he's on playmaking champions, he he lacks to make plays. So if Avan can set up a situation where they can exploit an, an over-eager bot lane attempt from order, that is one way that they can combat what is... Um, and I do agree that on paper they are mechanically probably superior to... to um, I'm going to call them Blake and Jinky, that's terrible. <laughs> Blake and Blinky. Um, and like I said, on paper they do look better, but there, there, uh, Avan's bot lane do have avenues into this game that aren't just you know, get ganks or, or, or naturally get ahead. They can, with their play, influence bot lane to what it would normally otherwise go. The rest of the map, I, I'm not I'm not really confident for Ivan in how it goes. Like, Pabu is a really good top laner, um, but Tally is looking substantially better this year than he has in splits past. Like, not all of them, like, just specifically 2017. He was... Felt like he was a, a little bit of a step behind his monstrous 2016 self, but he's getting back towards that point now. Um, so I don't know if they can blow up top lane like they like to. And so far, while Frey, I think, has played pretty well to decently, I don't think that he has smashed lanes in the way that we have, that you, you're going to want out of this matchup. And to be frank, in some of the ways that Swiffer has surrendered so far, the split. So I really think there's going to be, not maybe not so much, a lot of pressure on advanced bot lane to pick this up, but... They're going to have to be a stronger point of power in this matchup than I, I suspect they would like to have to be in order to win their matches. I don't think they are built to win matches through the bot lane, but they might have to do it in this match if they're going to do it how to do it at all. I definitely agree, and I think a really important thing as well is to make sure Frey is on a mid laner that can at least go even in priority. Because if you give Swiffer the priority champion, they are going to look... At look to exploit the bot lane and that's been a weakness that i've noticed over since the start of split for av is don't get me wrong they're good players it's just an area of weakness in the current iteration of av and the current iteration of av is a little bit against what they were last year and where they were scale more of a later scaling team as opposed to this year where they're the early game team the one thing i think i want to see out of frame in particular is i want to see something that um, that I, that aids his other lanes. Like his his um rise has been by far his best pick in my opinion. And to be honest, it's also looking at this by far his most picked champion. In fact, I think the only other champion he's played twice is more than once. I should say is Galio. Uh, yeah, just the one game. Possibly oh, I, and Oriana. I, I, I haven't accounted for last week's games. My um my tool is out of date. So he did play a couple of Oriana games yeah. last week, didn't he? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I'm not as fond of his Oriana as I am his Rise, but I am quite a big fan of his Rise. So that's something I'd like to see them secure, and perhaps maybe something that um, Order should look to devote some pick ban resources to if they can. The next game, though, we'll move on from Avant Order, is Legacy versus the Direwolves, and this is a much more interesting match than a 5v1 ma match appears on paper. Or they're not, sorry, Legacy are technically fourth, aren't they, because of... The 2 0, they've had all their wins have been 2 0. I think they might be and one they, point ahead of AV yeah, currently. Point, yeah, yeah, they're one point ahead because um, they've had three 2 0 wins and and 2 1 losses to both. So they're 3 3 and Avant is 4 2. But Avant's two losses have both been 2 0 to the Chiefs and Legacy have two 2 1 losses, one to Chiefs, one to Avant. So I think it's 11 to 10 if memory serves. I'm just opening up the page now. Yeah, 11 to yeah. 10. And obviously, AV dropped a potentially crucial game against Tectonic. Yes, that's their um, their other. Oh, geez, yeah, that's that's pro that is the re that's the only thing keeping them out of fourth, isn't it? Arguably, I mean, aside from also not picking like the, that's the thing that stands out as not as the reason why they're not in fourth. But anyway, um, Legacy versus Die was the match, and the reason I say that this is a more interesting match than the latter would otherwise imply is that. Legacy have been Dials Kryptonite in the um in the regular season. I believe they've taken a match off them in both of the previous two splits. Um, I believe Idrim missed that one on the cast. They went, when they were asking when the last time Dials lost the set was, and then I think that they definitely dropped a, a, a set to Legacy last year in split two. 
and I'm pretty sure they also dropped one in set one. So are we do we any chance of a repeat in this uh in this match or are we uh, are we seeing a pretty comfortable Diables victory? That's an interesting one because like I'll I'll start this off. I'll add a condition. If I uh, if Legacy choose not to toss the Baron, then potentially they could pick up at least a game. I think that while Triple has been looking good in recent weeks, I think Claire is honestly the best mid laner at the current time. He has shown to be incredibly good. And I think he's kind of proven a lot of people wrong. I think, at least in the OPL scene... Um, oh, at, at me next time. At me. <laughs> At least with, like, the OPL and scrims, people have always talked him up. Yeah. But when it came to game day, when it came to the outsiders, like ourselves, we didn't get to see that Claire. That Claire has finally shown up, and he's stomping kids. I don't even think it's so much that. Like, um, he is obviously playing very, very well, but I wouldn't say he's flat out mauling people. At least not in lane phase. Like, the one Chris and... I, I didn't mean to take this opportunity to defend my stance on Claire from 2017, but I guess I'm going to take it. Um, the one thing that I didn't like about Claire is that he was really, really bad at ganks. And when I say that, I mean he was way too easy to gank. He was always in positions that made early ganks easy. He didn't play ganks very well, and when he died, he gives up deaths in bunches in the lane phase. And that's the thing he's improved the most. I still think he's a little bit too easy to gank. And he has had a couple of times where he's had to burn both summoners where you felt like he could have arguably not had to. Last so week, it's yeah, tectonic. It... Yeah, exactly. Notably. Um, uh, so it, it's by no means perfect yet, but that's the thing that he's improved the most is that he's not so much giving up deaths in in bunches in the lane phase. Um, probably game one against Sin at the beginning of the split is the only example I can think of it, where we we watch game one of Legacy in the split and you're like, oh no, we're back to split one Claire again. Um, but ever since then, he has been really, really good at that. And the other thing he's done, he, he has always done really well. He's one of the best team fighting mid laners that we have. And in particular, you've seen it in key matches, both of them I would argue against. Um, actually, no, well, definitely last year against the Chiefs. And he had uh, the, the match against Sin, actually. He was, um, he was in that game one, he was behind in laning phase and just team fought on Azir absolutely masterfully. And they turned that match around that they were. Um, pretty decent whack behind in, back in week one but so that's the thing that's impressed me the most about Claire is that it, not so much that he is smashing people in lane although he is obviously still playing quite well it's that he's a real complete mid laner now I think um he does he, play, he has a pretty decent champion pool I would say a like, very good one plays champions very well in all phases of the game now and he can play very well from both ahead and behind and so that's that's those are all the tools you want out of your mid laner um, it's all very well and good to have a lane stompy player, um, someone that, you know, you, you go through lane, you, you, you fight a lot, and someone is coming out of this lane fed. That's a play style that was notably employed by people such as ZZZ slash Paradise. Um, that, you know, someone is coming out of this lane fed, or both of us, everyone, and there's going to be a lot of deaths. He doesn't do that. He controls lanes well, and uh, let's say... Um, the Azir performance from week one and the real standout match from Split 1 last year, I know that was 12 months ago, but that Victor performance against the Chiefs is was genuinely world-class Victor team fighting. It was poetry to watch. Anyway, so I've gone on a long roundabout <laughs> way defending my position, but that's the thing that's impressed me the most about Claire. It's not so much that he is, as you say, stomping kids, it's that he is a, and maybe that's what Scrim Claire was known for, is stomping people, but he is a real complete mid laner right now, in my money. Yeah, I agree. And I think he's transitioning. The big thing is being able to transition his early lead. Whether it be from a pick exactly. or a skirmish, he's transitioning, he's transitioning that early lead. He's putting the resources into his team, but he still ends up with all the resources. <laughs> It really feels like, um, and this is going to be a strange comparison, but he's almost a bit Steve Smith in the way that leadership really seems to have agreed with him. And he's really blossomed now as the captain of Legacy. I think that's definitely part of it. I think being more the experienced voice, it can change somebody. 
can change how they play. I think you you've seen it in the cricket with the Australian captains. You saw it with Michael Clark. You saw it with Steve Smith. For sure. Now the other thing I wanted to push back about getting back to uh, League of Legends real quick is um you mentioned that you you thought that Claire was the the best best mid or maybe even best player, but definitely best mid, best performing mid that we've got in the region. And I actually want to push back against that because I actually feel, I think it's triple. Um, the only problem with people noticing that it's triple is that the rest of the team is also playing unbelievably well. Um, or at least all the other laners. Chippy's is as strong as ever. King is, we're starting to see a bit of the old King again, um, who had faded away late last year, but has really come back in absolutely gangbusters this year. But I think that triple has won lanes consistently and really heavily. And I think that triple is a like the one the one thing that I think that the reason that I think Legacy did well against Dials historically is that Claire matched up well into Fantix. Fantix is someone if I can borrow a phrase from the corporate world here, who's to, to describe his champion pool as being deep but not wide. And what I mean by that is that he plays Fantix played a not I don't want to say limited because that's underselling him, but his champion pool is not as wide as some of the other premier mid laners. But he were, he was a mastery of, player. Yeah, the he level like of mastery crowned. he achieved on his ch- champions was unbelievable. And I think Claire covered him very well um, in terms of Claire's champion pool. Whereas I think the triple is does not afford Claire that same luxury in terms of being able to outmaneuver him in champion select with favorable matchups. So I personally, um, unless we see um, some mon- absolutely huge solo lane play out of Legacy... Um, and that includes Mimic, who has been good, bordering on great, but not quite there yet. So unless we see Mimic take that next step to being, uh, you know, on the level of a Chippies, and we, unless we see another captain's performance from Claire, I think this is probably going to be another convincing victory for the Wolfpack, which really does beg, us, beg the question that who can stop them? Yeah, I agree. Uh, so Diewolves obviously should take the series quite comfortably. I do think there is, obviously... The Claire factor, he can step up as long as his lanes are willing to allow him, and as long as they don't make any uh, dodgy Baron calls, then potentially they take one game, but it's very doubtful. For sure. Now, with Saturday done, we move on to Sunday, and our first match, we've got a couple of repeat teams showing up here, the last two teams, no sorry, we'll go one more after the second and third teams of the four to play their dual matches this weekend we've got Sin against the Chiefs and this is the get back and check I don't want to make a fool out of myself twice <laughs> this is Before... the this first is the first time. meeting of Tubes and Ryoma since <laughs> since they parted ways this is this is what I meant all along he said lying through his teeth um so this match, what, what what are we what are we seeing here? Is this um, is this as one sided as it looks on paper, or or have we got some play here? This is definitely as one sided as it looks on paper. Okay, can you craft a way for Sin to win? <laughs> Probably similar to their order match, where you're looking at Praetorth, you're looking at Jews, be able to get advantage on the top side. Um, but Doink obviously won't. Um, match up as well against Ryoma. They do share the Cassiopeia, obviously. Maybe yep. you look to take that away, but Doink's going to be looking for more champions. But for me, for uh, for Sid to win, big thing. Don't stuff up your ganks into um, what's Swiper. Don't stuff up the ganks. We have seen week in week out. Swiper is living from ganks that you really shouldn't be living from. I think we saw that particularly last week, maybe in the... Yeah, it played... was on, on our plays of the week, if, you, if memory serves the match. match. Yeah, Claire to get into facing off against uh, Vladimir and only was on Sejuani? Sejuani? I don't sounds, know sounds about any. right. Actually, I've got, give me one second. Or maybe I'm getting games mixed up. I feel like I said, is it, is it the Szechuan or Jar? That's not, that is a very 
that's pretty much my well, champion. Well, well, it wasn't Nidalee. Like we know that. <laughs> it wasn't the Nidalee game. That definitely wasn't the Nidalee game. Uh, yeah, Claire was. Oh no, they had to run on there. Oh, it's Kazix. Oh, okay. Oh, that's okay. right. Because okay. he over jump, he over jumps the Claire in the gank. That's right. Yeah, that's it. Um. Although at least we were right, there was a Sejuani on the map. Anyway, yeah. So you're dead right about the um about controlling ganks into Swiper. Although having said that, Juice has quite famously gotten his ganks into Swiper very, very right <laughs> with the uh, the Mad Life Body Bob onto Swiper in the Gauntlet last year, if you recall. Oh, yes. It was game I five. I um, I think I do. And yeah, he basically, I think it was level 2 or level 3. I think he might have gone buff, buff, camp, buff, buff, gromp, gank, or buff, buff, gank. Anyway, it was definitely within the first, Jews' first three camps, and they went straight up there, mad life flash, um, and they got first blood onto flares on his fizz, and everyone was like, oh no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we're having flashbacks from Sin beating AV3-2. So that that's actually the, when when I ask you the question, how do we craft a way for Sin to? Win, this is the point I wanted to bring up is that I think that this is a, the only way that we can win this match is through the top lane because, as I mentioned when we talked about Chiefs and Tectonic, that Praetith has already shown that um, not that I would expect him to smash Swiper regularly. I don't want to undersell Swiper like that, but he has shown that he is capable of getting a lead and winning against Swiper in lane. Um, and Juice has shown a number of times on a number of different top lane it's a propensity to camp not as I shouldn't say just in not, not just top lane it's a propensity to camp your solo laners um, and he's done it before he's done it against Swiper before so there is a uh, there's an avenue to get a lead in the top lane and the other thing is that obviously Juice is considerably more experienced than Babip and might be able to if he if he can't out 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 mechanics the young jungler he might be able to outthink the inex and the experience gap between Juves and Babip could be very important here. Potentially, and as you've said, it has to be the top side. The Bip should know this. The Bip has prepared enough that they know the enemy teams are probably going to strike top lane. That's the other you should be prepared well. enough to be like, okay, they're gonna gank top. I need to be looking for a counter gank. <laughs> Maybe we might see Babip in the top lane. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Well, I mean, you can't rely on playing Swiper out playing gank. kids every day, yeah. every second gank. <laughs> Let's no, be real although, here. Although he has been, maybe <laughs> not the best plan to count on it. So now, with so we're, we're predicting two zero to Chiefs. We think two zero anyway. Um, moving on now to the last game of the split, and oh, this is a clash of the titans. Two winless teams enter, one winless team leaves, because the other will have a win. It's the Bombers and Tectonic. What are we, uh, what, what are we seeing here? This, um, this has some interesting things, and I think this is a, coming at, come at a really good time for the Bombers. If they're gonna take any, if they're gonna take maps, this is a really good time to start some momentum. What, what are you seeing? I'm seeing a little bit of a mess, <laughs> to be frank. I think that Tectonic, while they're showing that they're they're like, okay, we're getting these, we're, we're getting some early game advantages. But then we're stalling, and we're not translating. We're not engaging. While they've shown that they were doing it better than Bombers, at least before last week, where they're like, okay not going to do too much, we're just going to keep stalling the game. And then you look at the other side, and you're like, we're bombers, we're not necessarily going to have a good early game before last week, and it's we're not going to engage, we're just going to look to stall the game. Do you see any common trend here? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling some generic magic here. Feeling a generic. I really hope it doesn't happen. But then we get to last week and we see some good signs from the Bombers. We see them starting to engage. They're starting to get on the same page and they're starting to engage. We so think that Sorry, go ahead. We, while we might not have saw it so much against Direwolves, they had some good moments. Once they hit that order series, they look like a completely different team. One day, completely different. Yeah, that's a, that, that looked like a team that can take matches. Now, to be fair, 
and this is the point I wanted to bring up about bombers. This being the start of something for bombers. Bombers' run home is tectonic this week. So if we just take, say that everything goes as well for the bombers, um, they've got tectonic this week. That's a win again. I mean, it goes as well as I can. They've got sin. The rematch against sin next week. If everything goes as well as I can, that's a win. They've got Chiefs the week after. Now, I'm, I'm sorry. Even if it goes as well as I can, that's not a win. But they, you know, they might have some. They might have something prepared, and maybe they take a map again. I think so, but best case scenario, a map, in my opinion. And then they close. If they've taken two wins in a row, then a map off the Chiefs. I think they close with a very winnable series against Legacy. Um, so this is if if anything's going to happen, if there's going to be any chance at all at avoiding the zero ten, because I because th I think if they lose this match, lose, if, if they do, do not beat Tectonic, they're going zero ten. Um, this is the match they're going to do it, and this is the the way that you want to do it. In they've just started fighting. You said that Tectonic are not super keen to fight. Um, and this is a this is a way to get Tiger unlocked, who has been for my money by far their best player. Um, there's been a bit of luge talk, particularly from from Benzel and his MVP columns, but for me it's been Tiger by a considerable distance. As you mentioned with uh, Raze and Destiny versus the Tectonic bot lane, this is the bot lane you want to unlock Tiger with. Is against low and tilting. So I'm I'm super encouraged for this match from Bombers, and I think it's going to come down. I actually think they they ought to win this very handedly, unless. Um, Coach Cyclone has a blinder. Well, I, I agree to some to some extent, but I think that we can't necessarily just look at Bombers' performance against Order and say, okay, they're looking good, they're going to continue on the up. So I think we have to be a That's little fair. bit more reasonable. While ideally you look at the talent on the roster, you're probably saying it's potentially a 2 0 for Bombers. Potentially, realistically, you've got to tone it down to a two-one. I think sleeping has probably been the most improved player in the OPL as of the last couple of games he's played. He has looked beyond what he <laughs> did against, particularly the ribbon against Chippies. That was an interesting one. He's shown that he's much better than that. That was a that was a bold one. To that was his first match. That was his first match. That might, that might not be one to knock off. Knock the. I mean, from the one hand, you want to put you want to put him on first match. On the other hand, Riven into game. Chippy's game plank is probably not one to knock the cobwebs off with. Um, yeah, that you're right. That was interesting to put it politely. So the one thing I think that uh, the one way in particular that I think the Tectonic win this is that um, Luch does. They've been losing a lot, and Luch is not a player. And nobody does, but Luch is a player who really does not like losing. And you could tell by the way that he, um, and I'm just, this is probably out of order for me to say this, but you can tell by the way, it was only a few seconds, but you can tell by the way he disconnected early from Um, it's the third time he's done it in the last two splits, going back to obviously this split and split two last year. Um, and for a player who's sitting on two suspensions doing something that sought out in the element was suspended last week, he really wants to stop doing that. For the want of staying in game for five more seconds and not appear, disconnecting on camera, just don't do it. Anyway, um, reason I bring that up is that Shock has played very well. Luch is not a player who handles losing very well, and Swaith can Swaith can handle Seb. Not saying he will smash him, but Swaith can handle him. So Definitely. if they start losing the if if Bombers lose the two v two mid, these imports might not have any get a chance to have any say on whether or not this match goes in the favour. I agree to some extent, but I think that if Bombers do draft, and they draft more so for their bot lane, they should be more than comfortable. I think low and tilting, honestly. They're mediocre at best. People can say that, they've, oh, they've been looking good, they've been playing passive. But they also played Sivir last week and weren't able to to push the wave in the direction of the enemy turret question mark so when you see things like that it starts to get really questionable with um, how they should perform in the bot lane and I think that Tiger and Rosie showed last week that there is an aggressive streak to them they can actually get a snowball a bot lane so I think that 
if Bombers do draft towards the bottom side, they'll be more than comfortable. And but I think if they the don't draft for the bottom side, then they might have some problems. The other thing that happens with Bombers, I think Rosie has looked at his best when he has picked champions that go forward, champions that engage. Um, even last year when he was niche picks, he took Zach. Exactly notably. Well, I thought Zach would have been the notable one. He definitely took Zach's opponents, I'm pretty sure. I'm I think positive. he might have played it He's once. Played I think he more. played Nautilus multiple times throughout yeah, the year did. at random times for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> Only Rosie would do that. Um, so, I'm going to, as much as I just gave the 2v2 edge, I would the 2v2 mid, mid jungle edge to Tectonic, I am going to stick to my earlier guns, even though you cry them as unreasonable, and I'm going to go with a 2-0 for the Bombers. How are you saying this match? What's your prediction? My brain is telling me that it should be a 2-0, but somewhere at the back of my mind it's just whispering 2-1, 2-1. <laughs> so I probably do have to go the 2-0. That seems a little bit more logical. Alrighty, so that is the yeah, that's the last game of the weekend. So that's that's where we are for the last of the super weeks. Um, I just want to quick close just before we move to the the last of our topics. Um, the the run home for a couple of teams in particular. Um, we talked about bombers' run home as one that they can pick up. Uh, um, possibly three wins and as many as ten points to close the split if if they play the cards right. I mean, they would. I would expect from them a minimum of six and up to ten points that they could hope for. And the other team I wanted to highlight, and you sort of touched on their their run to get here uh, in order. Um, in this being the first, except for the Diewolves match, one of their first real tests. If we look at um, after Friday, so from Saturday's matches to close the split, they have Avant, Die Wolves, their second, and then Legacy Chiefs. So they play the rest of the gauntlet to close the split. Um, so that a couple of teams, you know, we've got um, Order on one end and Bombers at the other, uh, getting maybe we'll we'll we might find a bit a bit more out about these teams than they've shown so far because they've had what I would say is vastly different strengths of schedule. Do you have any comment on those two teams their run home? Uh, pardon, which two teams again? Uh, Order and Bombers. So Bombers we talked about a little bit already, um, yep. but Order in particular have the rest of to close. Uh, so Order, obviously, I don't think anyone can argue this, but Order have had the weakest schedule to go up against. They were able to verse the weakest opponents at arguably the most convenient time in the split, where they are looking to build a team with five star, arguable star players. So, I to gel. Are, I think they're all stars. So, that obviously, you've got a lot of forks, you've got to gel together. Whereas you look at Bombers, they're looking with at a different issue where it's okay we've got these two imports where we've got a stable core in Seb, Luch, Rosie but our communication's off and you're going up against the top teams let, let alone you got subs for the first two weeks yeah, so it's, it's a bit hard to really in my opinion draw too many conclusions because they started the split with Avant, Bombers Direwolf before they played and like those are three you would expect them to go 0-6 the, the season obviously the loss against Din really hurt but it was really hard to make any and then they had a again then they played the Direwolves again so they've gone Avant Direwolves order, sorry Avant Order Direwolves Din Direwolves and then they've shown some promise against the Order so I think there's a genuine chance that the Bombers show up uh, are much, perhaps even much, maybe not much better, but definitely better than what they've been able to show just by strength of schedule alone. Yeah. It definitely, and I think it's part of the learning curve for Bombers. They obviously had some 
drastic issues with lack of engage, particularly. The shop. So what we want to do, uh, having wrapped up Super Week now, we just want to talk briefly about um about Headspace Round and the importance of something like this. Um, not not just again, as I mentioned before, not just for young people, but for all of us. So um, I don't really have a particular format in mind for what I was going to go with here, but Callum, do you just sort of want to touch quickly on what something like this uh, means for you and and the impact it can have on people's lives? Um, so I'll probably be quite brief, quite to the point. So um, for those who may not know, I have suffered from severe anxiety, depression, also panic attacks that basically originated in high school from a lot of bullying. Uh, I used to be a straight-A student, basically 90-plus everything. Um, once all that started happening, my grades dropped, started failing. Managed to pick it up for the HSC. Managed to get a 73 ATAR. Go to uni. First year was... I'm going to... I'll say it now. It was a breeze. I basically covered the content in year 12. So there wasn't too much pressure. Come second year of uni, obviously the courses started getting harder. I started to feel more pressure. And you see me going from averaging 80 to 90 in courses prior to final exams, where you need 50% to basically pass the course, to me failing the courses. That is the, and uh, okay. so and from then on, I obviously failed the next year. So I still have three years left of my degree. Up until last year, it was basically 80, 90, fail the final exam. Last year though, I basically looked at doing meditation and oh, I'm using the Headspace website actually. Meditation, um, dare I say it, Chinese herbal medicine works. <laughs> but I went from that to I control my panic attacks, I basically control my anxiety. And what happened was, it's okay, I'm not failing my final exams, I'm getting 90. That's, that's the difference. The difference is you go from failing to performing where you should be that's the difference it can have you can be a 90 you can be a 90 plus student but if you're not in the right headspace you can fail no, i'll no doubt. leave it as simple as that so my um my own story is maybe uh, it's a little bit different it's probably not one that's easily connectable to headspace specifically because i am i'm an old man just just recently 30 so um, I do uni in my spare time, so mine isn't quite as noticeable in my marks. Because, um, but the issue I've also had um, anxiety issues, and it's not a um, it's not something I really understood at first. Because you just kind of think that you like you don't even know what's wrong. So all of a sudden you 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 were at work, you're working away at normal, enjoying things, look, you think everything's going well, and then the next it it comes and goes, and that's the, the that's the real the thing you have to be careful of with um a, a lot of a lot of mental health issues is that it can just be hovering in the background where all of a sudden you're calling in sick and there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. You just can't bear the thought of leaving the leaving the door. It's not even so much a work thing. You don't. It's not so much you don't want to go to work. You just can't bear the the thought of going outside and. The one thing that I particularly struggled with was um, just felt like that that I was broken and failing, and there was no one would sort of understand that I it was just a I was a broken failure, and that there was no point asking for help because you can't fix that. And that's the kind of thing that I think is really important about something like Headspace Round is understanding things like concepts that they that they talk about it in um 
and even just silly things, though, well, I shouldn't say silly things, but things like self-help books and some of the basic level treatment you can get. Um, I, I was, I'm fortunate enough to work for state government and I get, um, I get a, a program through a, a, I forget what the name of it is. Um, sorry, bear with me a sec, I just had a mental blank. A, I got the, anyway, it's a, uh, a, something that a occupational safety and health team offers. Employee assistance program is the phrase I'm looking for. Um, where I got given a half a dozen free um, sessions with the with the psych psychologist, I think is the right one. Um, and I even I even went through um, uh, some like rudimentary hypnosis to try and treat my anxiety. And I think it's imp the reason I think that stuff like this is important is that um, that that kind of treatment um, without reinforcing those feelings they sort of add up into a, a, a period of a, a, like sort of like a despair type thing where you can't even you can't see a way that things will ever get better and so you don't even try and those those are the most damaging thoughts is when you're so deep in that that you can't see a way out and I mean, I hope, I'm pretty sure my, my manager doesn't want to listen to this, but I don't think it matters anyway. Um, I used the majority of my sick leave on more than one occasion, and as recently as last year, I used most of it on mental health related absences from work. So it can really, as Callum and I have just sort of shown, it can really help, um, impact you in multiple ways, in multiple areas of your life, your studies, your work, and then it flows on to your relationships with friends and family. And I don't want to get too, I didn't want this to get maybe quite as <laughs> glum as it did. But I think the important message is that these, the thing, the message I really want people to take away from things like this experience, this is the Callum and I have had, and things like Headspace Round, is that it's okay to feel like this. That as much as it feels like you're broken and you're a failure like I did, or that, you know, it's all, your life's been pushed back a couple of years than you planned because you have to repeat units or you're failing like Callum's sort of talking about and it takes longer to finish your degree than you would like. It's okay to have these feelings and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with them. They're not they're not the feelings are not wrong. Then you're not wrong to have them. And you and as cliche as it sounds, you can get help and you can beat it. And you just have to be able if you can find a way to to, to see the path to getting better if you let you you know it's it's not wrong to get help it's really not wrong it's the most important thing is that it's it's okay to ask for help you're not weak to ask for help and that's what organizations like headspace are for and that's what your friends are for that's what your family is for and that's one of the things that i mean it's we Calamonized Australians will associate it with that, but it's it's also a, a trait I've noticed quite admirably in people from New Zealand and everyone I've met from all of the various countries that are in this region that is Oceania. That it's really that's what we pride ourselves on is that it's a, you can people will help you, so it's okay to ask for help. And I've sort of monopolized the conversation there, but do you have do you have anything to add to that, Callum? I think I have something really important to add, and that is that don't expect immediate results. Yeah, I can't agree. As much as it's okay to have the feeling that negative feelings and to acknowledge them, it's really important to notice that to to note that it's it's all equally okay to not. It's not a light switch, and you will not get better by flicking it. It is a, it, it, along with everything else in life, whether it's getting in the right mental state frame of mind, whether it's climbing the ladder in solo queue, whether it's losing weight or learning a new skill, it's a process and it takes time and you will not nail it first try. And exactly. again, that is okay. Exactly. And the thing is, it you take time, it might take you seeing multiple different people. End of, the day, end of the day, you have to find out what will work for you as an individual and that takes time. 100%. And you know, particularly for those of us who are lucky enough to be eligible for the services of someone like Headspace, um, that means that, if I if I understand the mission statement correctly, that it's a youth-focused organisation. 
So it is totally okay that it's going to take time because you've got time. As I said, you know, there are people older than me in the scene, and I'm 30, and I've got, and I know I've got plenty of time in my life. You have lots of time to make things better, but it's important that you do it in the right frame of mind, and you'll accomplish so much more when you get there. And it's okay; it is 100% okay to take the time to get there. So I think on on that, as I said, it turned out to be a lot more somber than I had, in, I had in, in, intended it to be. But I think on that note, we'll uh, we'll wrap the show there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, you can catch Callum on Twitter at CDMLOL. You can catch uh, myself at LOLTIES. You can find all of our content at www.snowballesports.com or on Twitter at Snowball Esports. Until next week, where we will be back on a Friday. So until next time on the Friday Flash Forward, thanks so much. Good night.